Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Maria Almeida and this is the McKinsey Talks directly from the McKinsey Studio in Sao Paulo. This is our new customer-centric growth series. We'll talk to some of the world's most influential chief product officers about the challenges and joys of their position and go deeper into what makes a successful product-led organization, their role, their relationship with peers, the board, and explore topics such as talent, operating model, and much more. Product-led and customer-centric organizations are the winners of hyper-growth. The series will be led by Fabricio Dor, partner at McKinsey and leader of product design and customer experience in Latin America. Welcome, Fabricio. Thank you, Mariana. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to, uh, to be here again discussing this topic in the, in the customer growth series. Uh, and we know that the, the topic of product and product thinking is changing a lot how companies work. And there's a new breed of companies that are very customer-centric, so we want to learn more. Um, and, uh, and also how that impacts how traditional companies work alike. Uh, so I'm you know, happy, very happy to have this discussion. Great. And for today's conversation, we are here with David Lakatos, CPO at Form Labs. Hello, David. It's great to have you here as well. Thanks for the invitation. Really glad to be here. Great. Thank you, David. Welcome. Thanks, 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 David, again. Uh, just to, to start our conversation, I uh, just want to move into um, actually understanding What's your favorite product? And it can't be for yeah. maps. <laughs> it cannot be for maps. Yeah. Actually, um, I was thinking about this a lot, and uh, uh, it's a very old product. Um, uh, it, it was called Nabastag. And I'm not even sure I can call it a product, but I found it a really magical experience. It's the first time I moved away from home. I'm from Hungary originally. And um, it's, um, it's by a French designer who... Uh, came up with uh, this little cute bunny uh, where you can, um, first you were able to record messages and leave it on a, there were two connected bunnies. You can give it one to your parents or your girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever. And um, the really nice was, a uh, re really nice thing about it was you were able to move its ears and the ears were connected directly to each other. So if one of the ears was moving on the other side, the other one was moving as well. And I, I found it just, That sort of magic is really what I think make, makes products very, very powerful. And uh, this was back in 2006, so way earlier than, you know, a lot of the kind of interconnected IoT products, home products. And, and I think uh, one of the early explorations of, of really how we can use the interconnected world uh, in a more physical sense. Uh, so I found it really beautiful. A lot of, probably most people have never seen it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very good product to me. No, oh, that's a great example. And I think it, it reminds me of the, the early days of emotional digital interactions. It was a thing, right, at, at the time to create, like, to, to try to transfer emotions through technology. Uh, and now we have, you know, advanced a lot in, in, in that space. But, uh, but thanks for, for reminding me of that. It's a, it was a great moment of technology. Uh, and, um, and, and, and also, like, I want to, you know, talk about formulas, but actually I want to talk about you first. Because um, you have an amazing story, uh, you're a designer, you have been working in the field, um, you're an entrepreneur as well. Um, can you share a little bit of your background, please? Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to say that I'm, I'm very good at offending every single discipline when I say that I'm <laughs> part of it. So I, I'd rather not say anything, just um, you know, entrepreneur is good. It, it means uh, very little, so I cannot offend entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Hungary, um, uh, come from a kind of... A line of engineers. Uh, my father is actually uh, owns a, a large uh, contract manufacturing firm, so spent a lot of time, even as uh, growing up, uh, around manufacturing equipment and thinking about how to make things. Um, started electrical engineering, uh, ended up kind of um, uh, in a physics physicist uh, role. Uh, uh, was doing research in Delft, uh, University of Delft, um, and then uh, after. Uh, getting a vitamin D deficiency in a dark lab, I was like, "This is this is a beautiful discipline, but cannot cannot exist there long term." And um, randomly applied to the media lab at MIT. Uh, it sounded like a good kind of combination of engineering and um, and design and art and kind of more applied uh, thinking about technology. Um, to my very big surprise, uh, uh, Professor Hiroshi, she accepted me. Uh, mm -hmm. Still don't exactly know why, but I'm very <laughs> grateful for it. That really changed the uh, tra trajectory in my life and came over to Boston, still here. Um, uh, started a company out of there with two of my friends. 
uh, that we uh, that ran together and uh, uh, ended up uh, selling it to Dropbox, uh, moved out to San Francisco. I'm not cool enough for the Bay Area. Anybody that knows me will, <laughs> will uh, agree with me. So I moved back very quickly to Boston and um, been uh, uh, been part of Formaps ever since. We um, uh, Formaps started out of the Media Lab as well, and uh, uh, Max and Tan and, and David, uh, who started with, uh, we were good friends. So when uh, they were on Kickstarter and just starting to think about how to deliver the products, that's when when I joined. And um, yeah, been here for eight and a half, nine years, something like that. Yeah, that's really cool. And actually, uh, was that when Formlabs started as well, right? That was the beginning. It's it's very like very early on. Uh, so they when I yeah. came, they already had uh, the product on Kickstarter, but we haven't delivered all of them or something like that. I remember one of the very important moments for me was leaving Dropbox and coming here. It was literally like Tuesday afternoon, or I, I leave San Francisco, and then like Wednesday morning, I started here and. I went out with uh, for lunch with Luke, who's uh, lead sales, and I asked him, "So, how much did we sell yesterday?" And he's like, "I have no idea. I hope not a lot because we don't know how to make the machines." So that was like the first day. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Um, that that might have been a quite a change for you, right? Going from uh, software specific to uh, to physical products, although you do have that background, right? Um, w- was it was it a change in that in that in that way? How was it? Yeah, I, I, it's not. Um, I come from a much more physical um, uh, background, so I, I have, I've worked on hardware products before. I um, started a fab lab in in Budapest, which is a fabrication laboratory. That allows kind of everyday people to just go in and you know start interacting with three D printers, laser cutters, CNC machines, etc. So that's kind of where I come from. Software to me was actually a very unusual thing. Then I, I, I learned so much from my co-founders about uh, who come from a more software background, and um, to me that was a very rapid learning about how to make, um, you know, high speed, high iteration cycle software products. That was, uh, it, it's very. Most people will start there because it's much more accessible. But my background is like totally the opposite. So for me, this is more normal than that kind of quick uh, segue into the software world. Yeah, no. It's, it actually makes me think that um, in the end, it's all they're all products, right? They're different types of products with different characteristics. But what you want is to create something that's magical, something that creates engagement in in different ways, I guess. But also, um, I wanna uh, before asking um, a little bit more about the role, how you get there, how you got there, and and and, and so on, because you mentioned Formlabs a couple of times. I just wanna to clarify, like, what is Formlabs for people that don't know it? Sure. So Formlabs, we make 3D printers. Um, actually, there's one behind me. That's the Form 3. Um, and uh, the, the concept, so 3D printing, I think many people have heard about. Um, what's unfortunate in a, in a lot of ways is that um, most people engage with 3D printers on the, I need, uh, you know, something, a Christmas gift, and I want to, um, you know, build a Yoda hat for my, my kids or something like that, which is, which is perfectly fine. But 3D printing is so much more than that. And when we started out, the concept was if you want, if you're a professional and you want to use 3D printers for work, which is still the primary use case and, and still where most of the actual added value and the business is um, in the world, um, you had the choice of buying a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar very hard to use, um, you know, dedicated, like the dedicated person controlled uh, printer that needed a lot of know-how and it was very expensive to operate. Or you were, you were able to do outsource 3D printing through a service bureau that takes many weeks, or you bought one of these very cheap printers that just didn't have the quality or the, or the, or the repeatability that you would need for work. So the very simple concept with Formlabs is let's make affordable, accessible um, professional 3D printers. We started with stereolithography. That's the uh, type of 3D printing where you take a liquid and you um, use a laser or other light source to uh, polymerize basically uh, the, the parts. And you can make 
beautiful parts that are have, and I can show you some parts just for fun, uh, but like this is one of our uh, parts that is a, um, this is a millifluidic device specifically for, uh, I think it's for a, uh, 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 a um, chemical use case, um, uh, but we can make very high resolution, very intricate, lots of lots of different type of materials. And we were able to push down the price point to $3,000, which is two magnitudes below what anybody has ever done before. And um, that's kind of started us on down a path. Today, we're a much larger company. We're uh, 850 people um, and have 35 different materials on the SLA side. We have a smaller, larger machine. We branched out to a different type of 3D printing technology called selective laser sintering. You can make really rugged and um, and and uh, parts uh, that uh, you can put into final parts. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, but we can go into 3D printing until mm -hmm. forever. And I think that that's not what we want to talk about here, but anybody that wants to talk about it, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to. Um, and what's your role as CPO in Compasses at Form Labs? Sure. Uh, so what I'm primarily responsible for is uh, kind of our products. So product means to me uh, product management, product design, uh, and also marketing. Uh, and it's really important. I think the strongest organizations really are able to combine product and marketing together. Um, they are they're they're not. I think it's very hard to separate them for companies that are trying to build a strong uh, culture around coming up with what's coming up with what we should be doing, which always comes from what do people think about our current products? What are the issues that they have with it? And then trying to look far into the future and looking at what is the kind of the art of the possible, what are the engineering breakthroughs that we can, that we can expect and uh, that will kind of leapfrog ahead of us in competition. How will we position it into the market and how are we going to bring it to the market? Those are all things that, Many companies separate, but I think if you separate them too far apart, you're not able to really build a fast enough organization that can follow um, through uh, all the value uh, that you build up as a, as a, with a strong product. I want to I want to go go deeper into that because I think uh, you mentioned some things that are quite powerful and and, and 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 quite different from what most organizations have, right? And that's why I think uh, it's so special to to have this role and and this thinking. Um, you mentioned, for example, the like marketing and go-to-market, right? Um, you probably have different teams doing that. Like, how's, how are the teams organized? Because, um, like, from um, like product vision, product execution, build, uh, and also go-to-market, it's quite a quite a long list of things, right? Are those different teams? Are they integrated in a way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look. Um I'm going to just make a very quick caveat because I think also a lot of people that might be listening to this are from very large companies. So like, I don't know the solution how to do this at <laughs> 20,000 people level. I, I know how to do it at maybe a thousand people level. Um, uh, but these teams need to be all the time together and they need to be, um, um, they need, they need to not have diverging um, leadership. They need to have, a small group of people that everybody is working um, working together in in uh, big, uh, in, in um, basically on an everyday basis. Um, how we are organized? We have the product team again is, is product management, product design primarily, um, and um, and then we have a product marketing function that is very important uh, to to really help with that product management. Um, you know, goal is really to help define very early on with engineers. This is not a, you don't go to a, an ivory tower and then I, I try to stay away from the word vision. That's I think a mm -hmm. overused and, 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 and tough, tough thing. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I, I, you cannot do it in an ivory tower. You need to be doing it together with engineers. Otherwise there's no credibility. You cannot um, define a product on, on paper. You need to be doing it with a lot of validation and understanding how, how those, uh, what, what's possible, what do people want, and then trying to find some in between. Um, There's an iterative, difficult process, but that's the product manager's job. Get through the process and then follow the product all the way through until we're ready to launch it. Before we can launch something, that's when we need product marketers to really come in and help us uh, 
position it. Obviously, that that can happen and should happen earlier on as well. But uh, as we get closer, making sure that we understand what are the, the what are the properties of what we're developing because product evolves all the time. Like you can't. Mm-hmm. What we I would love to live in a world where we make a specification and then we hit it. Normally, that means that you are not trying to push yourself enough into the future. Learning. If you can reach exactly what you were aiming for, that means that, mm-hmm. that it was too easy. So usually it evolves what that thing is that you end up, ended up building. So you need to almost relearn what the hell you made at the end. So you can you can make sure that you can be honest because without honest marketing, you cannot be in the field. Nobody's going to take you seriously. So you need to learn again what the hell did you actually develop. And then you need to position that. You need to make sure that you, many years later, because our iteration cycle on the hardware might be a couple of years, three years, four years. In the same time, obviously, a lot has changed. You need to make sure that you understand what market you're playing in these days, what are the, what are the competitive pressures, and then uh, and then you need to bring it to the market. And obviously, the, we have a huge and very, very well-organized marketing team that um, then can do all of the you know, just bread and butter of launching a product from... Uh, all the creative assets, et cetera, building all of the campaigns, making sure that the segmentation has been done to um, thoughtfully go to the market and, and actually reach our audience that we want to to reach. So, um, but all these things, if they're not together, mm-hmm. then it doesn't work. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And also, um, the uh, something something that you you know you expand a little bit on the topic of the of 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 marketing and, and customer engagement, like beyond the product. Um, is this something that um, you take into account? For example, uh, communities engaging, uh, creating like you know content generated by uh, by, by customers uh, or forums or other pieces of like software digital interaction. For example, beyond the product, is that something that it's it's also within that that scope? You mean influencing the product specific specification or not necessarily, but but um, building on top of the usage. Of the product, for example, pre-made um, components that people can print, or uh, online forum or community. Is this something that is also part of the the I marketing see. thinking? Yeah. So, I mean, we have a very vibrant community forum that um, that I think is really good because I think probably for the right reasons. People don't always, um, you know, uh, trust the OEMs, and they want to hear from other people like them, and that's great. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think our forums are very good for that, um, and uh, and I, we have a very active community. We have sold over a hundred thousand printers, so there's just uh, there's a, there's a there's a body of community out there that are very active. Um, we don't find that um, the uh, that customers are looking for things to print. That's the beauty of professional three D printing that they have a use case. The reason why there are so many uh, 3D model repositories out there because simply there is uh, the, the, there is a this is cool I want to use it but they don't have they, they don't know how to design and if you don't know how to design uh, then you need parts uh, you know it's it's kind of like if a 2D printer manufacturer would you know send you love letters to print like <laughs> why would you do that you have you know you buy a printer because you have a use case for it so that's the mismatch there a little bit. Um, uh, so, so long story short, we don't, uh, we have some models that calibration models, we have some really, really cool prints, beautiful prints that, uh, some of our uh, customers made that we make available. But to be honest, most people don't, they're not interested in that. They have their own use cases. Uh, if, if any of the fortune five, basically all of the fortune 500 companies that have a hardware product have our printers, they, they're they, they print. They, they buy a printer for a specific project. Yeah, and I and I um, there, there's something special I think in in about form labs, right? Um, which is I don't know if you agree with that, um, but I, I would almost say like it's the apple of 3D printing, right? It has software, it has hardware. I don't know if you agree with that, the way of looking. I, I at think it. I think everybody will agree uh, being compared to Apple. So uh, <laughs> that, 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 thank you for that. I. Uh, we would try to live up to it. Obviously, there's a there's a couple zeros missing from our results. Uh, <laughs> to be you got there. You got there. Um, just want to uh, go back for a second into um, the building up to you being your your current role, because uh, you joined the company early on, uh, and and I bet you've been through different phases, let's say, or different moments 
for you and within the company. Can you just elaborate that on that a little bit? Sure. Um, look, um, I, I think that, um, and I know that we were talking about uh, being a chief product officer, but <laughs> the thing that I will I have to say here is that like, um, it, I, I don't know what this means. I think it's, uh, um, I think the way companies grow is everybody needs to do everything that they can or that they're the best at and that needs to keep on evolving and it has to do a lot with what other people are in 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 the company what other what things need to get done that changes literally every six months so the challenges that we had like i'll give you an example when i came in i don't think i even had a title for for the first couple of years, I think I was just wildcard or whatever, because it, it doesn't really matter. The only time it matters when you need, there is some sort of stuffy company that you need to meet with and they only want to meet with the CX, whatever, and then <laughs> it's important. That's 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 a legitimately, so we have a policy internally, but I'm worried about saying it because then maybe people will like meet less with our people, but uh, externally, you can use whatever title you want. If you can, can get away with it. If I would... Uh, you know, if somebody can be the CEO of Formlabs, uh, uh, you know, and they can get away with it, I mean, it's it's a stretch, but that's okay. Uh, uh, that's maybe a joke, but uh, you, you, I think you know what I mean. It's basically titles are, I think, a a weird thing that um, that is really only exists kind of like within internally in the company and externally in the company. They have different meanings. Uh, so I don't know what a chief product officer should be doing. I think it, it all titles are made up. Um, the, the only in the U.S. the only titles that matter are uh, president, secretary, and treasurer. I think those are the three things you need for an incorporated company. Everything else is made up. Um, even the CEO title is made up. Um, so I, I think what what matters is is you know who are inside of the company, who's responsible for what, and then what do you call. The, doesn't doesn't really matter, but you asked about how how I got there. So, mm-hmm. um, um, uh, in the beginning, really, uh, especially in form labs, the 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 issues are everywhere, right? Like, how do we make stuff? How do we sell it? So, uh, I think it's really important for somebody who is thinking about products and marketing and business development and stuff like that um, to 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 really have a deep understanding of how do you sell stuff. What are the ways that you can position, like that on the sales side? How do you position a a product? How do you generate demand for it? Uh, which is a very deep topic, obviously, especially um, in you know in the modern world. I think it's it, marketing has become a complete. I don't I don't know anything about marketing. Obviously, I, I'm a physicist, um, uh, but uh, but I think what what it has transformed into is a highly quantitative. Uh, very fast response, experiment and measure. And I'm seeing more and more physicists actually there because I do think that the experiment and measure is like a very fundamental tenet um, in, in any science. So I think it works super well when it comes to uh, these modern type of marketing uh, games. So um, I, I think that understanding the how a modern company uses a high-speed funnel um, is, is is very important for products. Obviously, there are different products. Price point determines a lot of things on what what can you use to to really effectively go to the market. A thirty five hundred dollar product actually fits super well into a, a high-speed funnel um, type of environment. However, if you would be selling a fifty thousand dollar product or a hundred thousand dollar product probably you would run into the wall and that's not a good good fit for it. Or vice versa, if you're selling a hundred dollar product, you can't afford a salesperson probably and you only have marketing. So it's a it's a continuum. And I think that learning about that it was really fun. At Formlabs, we have products ranging from now to three thousand to thirty thousand dollar product uh products on the on the fuse one versus the, the form three side. Uh so it's it's a really interesting we're in this like interesting nether zone between how you how you go to the market with the different type of products. And no, no, this, I'm not trying to say that these are all solved. I think that we are inventing, we have reinvented the way to go to the market in 3D printing. When we came to the market, every competitor, and still to this day, most of our competitors only sold through the channel and resellers. And that is a completely different uh, way of going to the market than we are. We, we have still... 50% of our market is going directly to the market. And that's a very powerful 
um, a differentiator because we know a lot more about our customers. We can respond a lot faster uh, to their issues, but we can still rely on our channel partners when it comes to further away locales, uh, different languages, uh, and some specific industries. The CPO role is uh, a new role and a newly made up role <laughs> and title. So why do you think, is this why companies, many companies still don't have a CPO or why do you think is that? Certainly not every company needs a CPO. Uh, maybe not all of them need it. Uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, there's obviously a lot of companies that are, uh, that, that they don't have um, products the way we define products, which is a um, really making, I think maybe it's it's worth like clarifying what's so different about Formlabs versus IBM. IBM, you would go to them and some people would say that IBM has products or, or uh, uh, but in a lot of ways, uh, I think if you have a product that you need to customize for every customer, I would call that a solution-based business or a service-based business. And um, what what I think uh, a good differentiator here is, is are you selling the same product over and over again, or are you selling a customized solution to someone? I think if you are uh, the former, uh, selling the same product over and over again in high volumes, that's when you need um, a more clear, then I think everything starts with what's the product, and then how do you... Uh, encapsulate the most amount of value in it so then you can replicate it and then gain market share or leverage based on getting as many of them made as possible and by that pushing down the price as much as possible. If you have a solution where 50% of it is pre-made but then 50% of it is customized for every customer, uh, that's a totally different business and that's going to be driven a lot more by how you know the sales team or the application engineering sales engineering team um, helps the customer kind of close that last mile um, and there it matters almost less what's in the first 50 percent and I think then then you need less of this encapsulation and 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 marketing kind of big launches and 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 figuring out how to go to the market fast um, because it's going to be a continuously evolving product solution um, Yeah, I think that that's, that's maybe a key differentiator. Yeah, and also, um, I just want to touch on, on, on this in a, in a different way. Um, there's something that, there's a, there's a topic that's emerging, I think, through these different conversations, right? Um, which is uh, the, the correlation between companies that um, are very customer-centric and companies that change, independently of the title, right? Uh, they're, they're changing the way they do things to be able to continue to be customer-centric. And I think I'll take the example you mentioned uh, on uh, the go-to-market and the direct-to-consumer and not going through uh, distributors, for example. Um, I think consciously or unconsciously, and I think a lot of this was very conscious, right, uh, was uh, there were a series of choices that were made through time to be able to be close to consumers, to learn about them, to, to build you know, better products and, and, and to, to have that. Um, Because you could have different choices, right? You could have, like, the organization could have moved in a different way and separated, for example, sales from product, in that for that matter, or marketing from product for that matter, right? And and not have the same, the same outcome, right? Um, yeah. And 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 I think the, um, the 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 point there is also um, so first first point is customer centricity. The second point is um, talent, right? Because you probably need a, a good breadth of different talent. To be able to to do that work, so just want to go deeper into that as well. Like, what are the different skill sets that you have to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Obviously, an evolving one. Uh, I think that, um, especially on the product side, what I'm looking for is uh, kind of two of three things. Um, Out of the three things of being um, business acumen, uh, technical background, and customer obsession. Um, and there are very different ways that a candidate can express these, but uh, without at least two of these, ideally all three, uh, I think it's very difficult. I think the best profile is still an entrepreneur. When it comes to, I'm talking about product managers specifically, um, 
I think that um, you you really need you really need these traits, and I find it that people who have started companies and delivered products. There, there are many people that start all sorts of random companies, even raise money for them. That that to me doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if you uh, learn how to build a product, ship it, face the consequences, <laughs> good or bad, and then iterate on it. If you have demonstrated any of that, then you have such a it, it, you are way ahead of people that might have been working for a decade or two because uh, they, they really felt that uh, burning of like understanding why you're doing something, actually doing something about it, and then learning from the experience. Um, so I, to me, that those are the three skills. And, and a lot of times asking for all three is difficult, but having two of those and technical background or an engineering background or a deep obsession of taking things apart and putting it back together is, is I think is very necessary. So it's really that plus either, and it's not about having an MBA. It's, it could be that you, you know, you started an Etsy store and you, uh, you balanced your books for a couple of years or whatever. Um, or, or it can be, uh, uh, or, or it can be like being part of having a weird finance degree that, uh, that you don't talk about very often. Doesn't matter. Um, and the customer obsession is really just like demonstrated ability to, um, that have, have had experience talking a lot to customers solving for their problems um, and and working with customers to 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 really understand the difference between somebody who's unhappy with what they have in front of them or or very happy and they want more um, uh, you, you need to not you, you that's that's one of the that's a lot of things that engineers like um, uh, is the ability to kind of go outside of the company and, and learn about what's out there and learn what the customer wants and, and having the patience to listen to them and, and then synthesize it to something that is actionable. That's that's very difficult. That's very cool. That's very cool. Uh, just want to um, go into, into um, another another um, topic, which is uh, on the organiza- organizational side, um, who are our, your counterparts? Right. Can you explain to us a little bit more about the organization? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, I, I guess uh, what probably would we have um, probably explaining who are the people who are kind of uh, mm-hmm. leading the company is uh, worth it. So um, uh, we have uh, we have a person who's leading uh, sales and services. So uh, kind of globally responsible for um, who are the what are the regions that we go into? Um, what composition? Uh, the sales team should be in the, those different places. How do we allocate resources? Uh, we have a person responsible for operations manufacturing mm-hmm. um, uh, who is responsible for actually making our stuff. Uh, we are manufacturing in um, uh, in uh, in the Far East, and uh, and it's uh, obviously it takes we it's it's great that we are we don't we don't have that um, uh, we don't have that. Um, burden on us to like actually build up a manufacturing plan but working with a contract manufacturer is uh is no easy uh no easy feat um uh, we have a person responsible for for people operations who's uh obviously these days is a very difficult job uh, with uh, uh recruiting uh heating up and um growing the company and and keeping the spirit of the company and not making it suck, even if we <laughs> scale up to be 10 times bigger, 100 times bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and we have, we, have, uh, uh, we have also a person responsible for all of our legal mm-hmm. um, uh, work. So those are the people roughly responsible for different parts. Obviously, mm-hmm. we have many, many more leaders on yep. you know, marketing and, and, yep. and, and systems, et cetera. But those, those are... Uh, Kind of people overseeing different functions. Engineering is actually um, so, and then of course I didn't talk about uh, our CEO Max, who's responsible for uh, for most of our engineering. Uh, I'm responsible for our materials engineering as well, and uh, he's responsible for everything else. Um, it's an interesting split. Unfortunately, we are reaching the end of our session, so okay. you have time for one more question. Okay. No, there's one question that I think uh, would be interesting to to hear um, your perspective, um, but also because it's a 
it has kind of broad implications. Um, I mean, we all um, have heard, I think at this point, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about 3D printing myself. I have a 3D printer at home. Um, and, um, and, and I think most people have heard about 3D printing at this point. Um, and uh, you've been involved in the topic for quite some time. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and involved in a product that is actually changing habits right around printing, which is, I think, part of the, the future of it. But really the question is, what is the future of 3D printing? How you see that evolving yeah. and, and impacting different industries and impacting people's lives? Sure. So um, I think this is a really interesting topic, so you need to stop me at one point. Um, <laughs> Go on, I think no that um, I think professional 3D printing is is where the future is. And um, a lot of people talk about like having a printer in your kitchen, etc. I'm not saying that that won't happen at one point or in some limited capacity, but that's I don't think that that's where most of the value add for the world for 3D printing is. Um, I'll tell you uh, an interesting part of our business that I think it really is pointing towards the future. Um, uh, we call it healthcare, which is mostly dentistry and a little bit of medical. The dental industry plus 3D printing is extremely exciting. Um, over the last five years, uh, we built up, uh, and now a good chunk of our business actually is coming from these two uh, verticals. Dentistry is, is, is amazing. You have uh, our printers making surgical guides, dentures, like full dentures. I should have had a part here, but I don't have one here. <laughs> uh, full, full dentures, uh, uh, splint, snide guards, aligners, invisible aligners that I think a lot of people are familiar with. These are all things that come off of 3D printers. I think that that's going to accelerate. We're going to see 3D printers move closer to you, the customer, the, the final customer of these, these devices. We already have not only dental labs, those are kind of central manufacturing facilities that your dentist today is using. You're going to see uh, de actual dentists adopting this technology. And uh, that might not sound that that crazy or fun or whatever, but that's a huge deal. Mm. That means that we're going to be installing hundreds of thousands, millions of these machines into, dent into actual dental offices. Uh, and you will be able to have procedures done on you at your dentist that would have taken many weeks. Sometimes the dentist will be able to perform this in one or two visits because they will be able to print inside, uh, on site, and you can, after after a scan, uh, they will start printing. And while they're cleaning your teeth, by the time they're done, they can grab, whether it's in the liner or they can try in a denture, and then you will go away and then come back in a couple of days. And then instead of that process taking sometimes many months, you can get it done in a few visits. Mm -hmm. So where is this pointing? I think this points to a future where you have 3D printers are going to be involved in a lot more products. And uh, some people say that 3D printing is going to take over the take over the world and uh, it's going to impact uh, you know, many trillions of dollars manufacturing industry. I, I don't believe in that. I think that that's, that's, that's hype. Uh, what I believe in is that there's a lot of products that are going to uh, have customization uh, on them. That means that take your earbuds, we can customize your, uh, your earbuds. It will, they will never fall out of your ear. It's going to have perfect uh, noise cancellation. Uh, it's going to have a perfect sound quality. We can customize your, your glasses. Uh, it will allow you to have, I have very big face, as you can tell. Uh, I don't find a lot of sunglasses. If like I'm able to print these sunglasses for myself, I will be happier. We can print helmets. We can print custom garments. We are able to print. If you break your arm, we can make a custom uh, splint for you. That means that you won't have to put up, uh, you know, gypsum for the entire summer. I had a broken arm for a summer. I like half of my arm was like rotten by the end of it. That's, we can get rid of that. We can make a design that is, um, that has, uh, that is, has an organic structure on it that breeds well. Uh, and, and all of that is the best. I think there are a ton of products like this. And I see, 3D printing moving closer to the end customer, not into their home, but let's say at an Amazon fulfillment facility. I think that we're going to see a lot of these fulfillment centers having 3D printing capabilities so they can take a standard product, apply 3D printing to it, and create a value-added product that then only needs to travel the last mile to get to the customer. 
I think that that's coming. It's already here in dentistry, mainly because those are very expensive and highly customized products. But as we push down the price point of these products, we're going to get more and more products closer to the customer and and, and with a higher value add. And I, I think that that's not far. We're already seeing a lot of examples for this. And I think as we are uh, iterating on the reliability and, um, and the uptime of these printers, they're going to be so easy to use and, and, and so obvious as a business model that we're going to see more and more of them uh, being transformed. That's really cool. That's really Very cool. Just interesting. Uh, <laughs> one final remark on that. I think thanks, thanks a lot for, for that. That's, that's super inspiring. And it's great to see where, where this is going. I think just finish with, like, from on my end, just with a, with a quote on that. Uh, one of our fellow uh, product leaders that was here in, in this conversation, he said that great products uh, are the ones that change industries. Um, and I think that's the same that's happening with Form Labs, with 3D printing. So thank, thanks a lot for that perspective. Awesome. That, thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you very much, David, and thank you, Fabricio, for being here with us today. The customer-centric growth series will be published as a McKinsey Talks video and podcast on YouTube and Spotify, but also as a short article on mckinsey.com.br. If you would like to know more about product-led organizations, send an email to mckinsey-talks at mckinsey.com. I would also like to thank all of you who are watching us on video or listening to us on podcast. And go to mckinseytalks.com for a full agenda of McKinsey Talks. There, you can also check out these episodes and earlier ones on video or podcast. That's it. Thank you very much and see you next time. 